let's face it, he, he was an arrogant soldier, right? a very smart arrogant soldier, but he did have to get the call done. So, but I think uh, I'm going to... You got him on the 4th of July. <laughs> 4th of July. He was on. So, um, what can I say about rates other than, you know, British banks and, and, and rates? So, don't fight the Fed. Don't fight the ECB. You're living in an era where I think we're going to stay with this policy for at least another couple of years. Okay. Hopefully we'll have a better LIBOR rate, right? Because um, I do actually use LIBOR as my own preference. Okay, so that's basically the global macro story I wanted to give you for financial planning. You have to take into account that. So the rest is, you know, not really too relevant. I'm just going to show the usual macro numbers, but there's nothing more to say. I've already said what I think of austerity and economics. I've already explained why you're living with this dreadful picture, okay, the Super Mario Brothers, right? And there's an interesting economic pattern here, right? Any, any country led by somebody with the name of Mario or Mariano, in the case of the Spanish, or Mar Mario for ECB is negative, right? And anyone, any European country led by somebody with a girl's name is positive. <laughs> and if you've actually got a real girl, like the Germans have, then you know, you're doing okay. But, but this pattern of dreadful demand contraction, that supports my case. If you pile on fiscal austerity and the, the state part of GDP on a huge private sector deleveraging, okay, and a terrible unemployment rate, consumer confidence plummets, right, investment sense plummets, because companies will not invest if consumers are not getting out of bed and spending money in retail. You get dreadful patterns of growth, and every single budget number you see is, is nonsense. Spain is not going to live through half a percent negative next year, right? It's going to do minus one to one now, right? France is not going to hit that 2% number they put in that latest Holland budget. They'll be lucky if they make a percentage point right, going forward for the next three or four years. Britain will be lucky just to keep its head above the water. The US, there's my baby. Okay? So despite the geopolitical risks that I've told you to look out for very carefully, you should be long US equities, you should be taking risk assets, is getting out of bed. It doesn't look as pretty as it should, right? The green arrow is at least green, but retail sales are plus 3.6%. That's pretty anemic. I'm not saying it's where it should be, and we've explained why, because of the politics. But they are recovering, and the most important thing is what's happening with my critical metric of housing. So they'll eke out some growth. It's not the 2%, what I think is going to be the run rate that they have for the next three years, rather than long-term trend of three. But it's a hell of a lot better than Europe, and we depend on these guys. Now, waiting for the US consumer, right? Katie Perry. Okay. This, is, this is what happens when you have an 11 year old daughter. I didn't know who Katie Perry was. So it's not scary, but this, is, this is the US consumer. Everything depends on the deleveraging process running its course. Yes, it's still slow, and yes, they're still highly leveraged. We all know that they're Americans, but the fact the trend is unmistakable. You cannot argue against the economics. It's only the politics holding it back. And personal savings rates are now dipping down, but they're positive and they'll stay positive, only because people are starting to shop again, which is what they want, and starting to spend a bit on their head. This, for me, is my critical metric. I always go on about the ecosystem around housing. Okay, so I've given you a couple of key messages today. Don't fight the Fed my view on the Euro and the Eurozone, no exit, we will stay together, the Euro will live, it will be all right. Okay. This is my third key message I'll stand for. This is the turning point. Whatever the politics and the fiscal cliff do to it, it is turned the corner. I told you last time, I said this is bottomed out, it's now got a turn, right? And it's turning at a rapid clip, okay? It has been in the toilet for a full, for five years now, because in fact, US housing tipped in 06, not in 08, okay? And for the first time, you're starting to get housing starts that are getting up to a reasonable level, 70,000 a month, okay? Nothing like the peak, okay? 200,000 a month, or the long run average of 123,000 a month going back to May 1963, okay? But it's turned. If you wanna bet on this, 
I would bet it. Okay? U.S. housing will drive the recovery. And the ecosystems that are paying for the lights and dogs and gardens and uh, what's, what's the DIY place called? Home base and all that stuff. All depend on this number. I would bet on it. Right? But never say never again. We'll be back there again because, you know, housing, you get a boom and you get a bust. But you won't have to worry about that for another eight years. And finally, unemployment. Everybody makes a huge fuss about oh, 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 unemployment so, as if their current monetary easing is not helping. Even though it's a blunt thing and they should be doing more with fiscal. It is. If you remember, we put up that green line on my view on our forecast of how long it's going to recover back to the 5% level, right? Most optimistic, five years. Most pessimistic and likely base case, seven years. It's dead on track, and it's ahead of the seven years, it's on the five year track. And it took seven and eight years in the last two recessions. There's nothing wrong with the recovery in US unemployment. It's slow, and it's noisy, but the data is messy as well, but the long term trend is there. Right? Just in time for the Obama election. Retail sales, yes weak, not as good as they should be, but they're there. But where it seems to be coming through is buying iPhones. These are, by the way, this is, this is around the world buying iPhones. What a great company to have, right? In, in all the major capitals in, in the world, right? Um, and look at Apple's numbers. But the worrying thing is the Cisco, which is more geared to the corporate recovery and reinvestment cycle, is weak. As I said, corporates won't invest until they see the American consumer fully functioning, and then they'll invest. But I'm firmly of the belief this is more than green shoots, and I would buy the US housing recovery. I wouldn't buy a US house, but I'm buying the US housing recovery. Um, manufacturing, okay, but here's where the consumer spend is coming. Now for me, that makes a big difference. I've always said to you, because I play this game myself for my Asian urbanizing middle class thing, Cars is where it's at. That's the biggest discretionary big ticket item that you buy when you're feeling flush and you can actually afford things and you're feeling okay, right? And even SUV sales are back on the rise again. You know those huge things with V8 motors that use tons of fuel, with a more expensive fuel, they're back on the rise, okay? So it seems to be coming through in autos. I'm sure that GM and Chrysler are looking better than Ford because there must have been some discounting stuff and so on, but the recovery seems to be there. Now you understand why I am only long the US, I've always been like that, a couple of years, and short Eurozone, and short UK. China, now as you saw the numbers, you know, yes, this is a slowdown, right? Is it gonna be a disaster? Are they gonna have a hard landing? No, they're not gonna have a hard landing, but 7.6%, shoring, 9.6%, and I do not believe that Chinese the Chinese are going to recover back to those old growth rates, and a lot of economists can see that as well. I have one particular reason why. How can you slow down so much in Chinese growth? Right? How can you have a terrible export number? Look at export growth. Right? You can see how dependent they are on when the developed world is doing well, and because Europe has taken everybody down, and US recovery is very slow, their exports get hit, and their consumer spending and consumption is not big enough to make it up. That consumer spend number would have to be 20% and above to put an extra percentage point of GDP to get it back above 8.5%, right? But how come labor markets <coughs> remain tight and unemployment remains low? This is my worry about China. When I go on record and say I'm nervous about China, I'm not saying they're economically mismanaged and there'll be a big collapse and a hard landing. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that they have run out of the demographic dividend and the aging has captured the public. And I always said, stood in this room and said, you know, sex trumps economics, okay? And if you're not gonna have babies, you stuff yourselves, right? Because you've got to produce consumption. It's a consumption economic game in the long run. And China is now rich enough. They're now nearly $7,000 a cap, right? They have to be consumers. They have to be getting shopping. And if you don't have people to go shopping, right, you have a problem. Now, you've got 1.35 trillion. That's great, right? But the fertility rate is 1.8 and declining. By the way, the replacement rate is 2.2. .2. I 
right? Anyone didn't know that? Singaporeans, 2.2. What's Singapore doing? 1.3, right? You're all dying, okay? Japan's been dying for a long time. So we always sit back as economists and investors Wow, you know, China, the economic miracle, 9% growth, 10% growth, bullshit, again. Economic history is wonderful stuff. Go back and look at the US 19th century growth patterns, right? They were the same as China, and by the way, they're playing the same game, exporting to us in Britain, and we were calling to have them strengthen their currency in the US dollar. Exactly the same stuff was going on 100 years ago, it's fantastic. We couldn't invade them anymore because we've lost already. <laughs> and they've destroyed a lot of good tea in the process, right? So we had to try and get them to force their currency. We, 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 we failed. They were growing regularly at super high rates because they're doing a huge demographic dividend, not by making lots of babies, but by importing people from all over the world. Ireland, Italy, God knows where. Okay? However you get there, us economists, we don't care. All we care about is consumers. You can buy them, steal them, make them, immigrate them. They have already peaked, okay? So a lot of the growth came from an enormous number of work. This line is only the working population. If you go from having 200 and, what is that, uh, 330 million working population, and you double it, of course your economy is going to grow, duh, okay? It's not labor factor productivity, it's just a lot of labor. That's one of the reasons why the US can continue to grow on long run rates more than us in Europe, because they continue to increase their population about 150 a month, 150,000 a month, right? So they've reached that peak, and they've reached the peak, by, by our calculations, because they're meant to reach it in 2015, they will be about $8,000 per capita. Well, Japan reached the same peak at 15,000, and South Korea reached it at 16,000. This is what economists mean when they say China has a danger of getting old before it gets rich. Okay? And unfortunately, it's a real issue. And um, as you get that situation, the only real solution to it is immigration. Okay? And most North Asian countries have either resisted that or just culturally say we'd rather go with lower growth. Don't think you're going back to the days of perpetual 9-10% growth for all of you who invested in China. I've never believed that. I don't invest in China. Right? You know, your long-term trend is going to be more like um, 7 to 6. Right, Casino Royale. There were two, right? There was the latest one, which was 2007 or 8. And the first one was 62.
super prize this in spring. The, the time at which that Greek guy set fire to himself and the Spanish bombs uh, two years went up the last seven percent. Okay. So Bernanke is right. There's nothing here to say you shouldn't be investing in risk assets and equities. And he's forcing you to do it by pushing you out the door and making treasuries and risk-free very unattractive and, and basically at inflation rates, you effectively get zero. And he said, don't worry, I'll keep it at that for another two years or so. So there's no risk of inflation. Why aren't you guys out in risk assets and equities go and buy them now and cycle the money through into corporates and into uh, consumers? Okay. And I fully believe okay, it's just for me, it's, it's a US story, not a US story. I have to say, you know, already some of that's come into the market rise this year, so US equities are not as cheap as they were, but there's some good stuff. Out. The final thing I want to say on investors, Goldfinger was 60, or it's all it's the 60s one, the 65 or 66, with the guy who threw the bowler hat. Or job, right? Um, for me, one of the biggest issues in the last three, three years is, uh, and this is why I don't know he's doing this, right? You're all lily-livered, <laughs> you know, risk-averse, got massively scared off, right, and haven't got back into the market yet, right? Which is good news for the sponsor, that's what I'm saying. I have very little respect for non-professional investors. I'm sorry to say. That. Now we all know there's endless research to say that non-professional investors always go in too late. Uh, they buy when things are already going up. They, they sell when things are going down when they shouldn't. They never buy low and sell high. They never buy fundamental macro stories or underlying trends or themes and then put their money in and back it. They, they talk about being long-term and backing the story, but they never are. They're short-term. They treat everything as traders, right? They don't invest like our fitness value investors and buy the company rather than the stock and all that kind of stuff. All of that stuff is absolutely 100% true, right? I wouldn't want the job of a financial advisor because you're dealing with a bunch of muppets all the time and trying to persuade them to do the right thing. And most of the time they don't. And it harms themselves. Right? But you haven't been in risk assets the way you should have been. I was starting to buy US equities in at least two years ago. And you end up with poor returns. The second thing about that risk aversion is a lot of the interesting stuff going on uh, in a world of almost zero interest rates. The bond market is rubbish, and equities have been very volatile. Don't play the game carefully. It's mostly interesting stuff has been in real assets, in commodities, in illiquid stuff, and in long-term stuff. But none of you like illiquidity, and none of you really like the long term, although you claim to. Right? Hello, you're meant to be, you know, investment is investment. You put it in there, if you want to pay your rent with it, you shouldn't be investing. Okay? And if you try to trade, it's a mug's game. And if the investment is doing well, locking it up for five years doesn't matter, does it? And for all of you who claim you want to keep it for liquidity, you know what? You actually lock it up for five years. Because what you do is you lock it up when the markets are going up in equities. This is the pattern that's a lot of analysis has shown non-professional investors do this. Then when it goes down, right, you don't want to sell at a loss, so you lock it up all the time it's going down, and then you keep it, so you end up being locked in for five years anyway, or you've made such bad investments because you bought structure <coughs> from some investment bank, that you just lose it all, right? In which case it doesn't matter. So what I've done here is show you that a lot of the more real, long-term, illiquid assets okay, have done the best. Right? And I have been cheeky, but you can allow me to. <laughs> not once, not once in seven or six years of economic briefings have I ever talked about what we do. Ever. Or tried to market it. And I'm not trying to market it now. Right? I'm not interested in those sorts of investors. But I do just want to, since we just happen to have done our three-year fund account, I'm not putting Sri Lanka in because that's unfair because we make 50% a year in Sri Lanka year on year and we don't get out of bed for less than 25% anyway. But I did want to show you what a long-term illiquid niche white space in the market value-added investment can do if you get rid of this funny notion that everything has to be liquid. Right? So um, forgetting the fact that we are 
42.6%, correct, in the accounts. So there's a few investors, I'm not sure, I think a couple of our investors are sitting in this room and they're happy because we just basically doubled their money in three years. But other people can do it, okay? Uh, the, the infrastructure funds done very well, the REITs have done very well. You can see things linked to real assets and real estate and even just straight uh, Singapore land have done exceedingly well. Gold has done exceedingly well in times of high volatility, risk aversion, okay, and moving to commodities. I'm not a gold bug because I, I still think it's a very difficult to read, dangerous asset. But in, in, it is a risk asset and it is a game that some people know how to play and it's done well. Okay. Um, some of the technology things, consumer staples in the US, I've been banging on about US consumer, US consumer will be the first to get out of bed. Okay, and whole positions in that, and that's done well. Oil, you know my, that I'm a also card carrying, um, you know, peak oil theory guy. Uh, that's not peak oil in the sense that there isn't more oil to discover, but peak oil in the sense that all the easy stuff is done. So remain long-term bullish on oil, and that's done well. S&P 518 so you've got to get down there. Look at Asian equities, right? This is the trouble with risk off stuff it actually hits the emerging market. But if you look at where investors have been putting their money, right, by a factor, okay, of one to 10, and in some markets, one to 20, it's all being put down here. Bonds, right? Bonds, 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 and Asian bond funds, and this bond fund, and when you open the, the papers, all you see is bond funds, right? And dividend income funds, and a few other things. And other people have been buying hedge funds. Okay. Which, of course, yeah, it's a black box thing, you don't know what they are, right? You can't trust what they have no idea whether they're going to do well or not, but you can see how they've actually done. MSCI world, 6%. Okay, so that's three year return. I think the Fry Group, you think three years is a reasonable level to look at. Okay, I will finish on because. A couple of people ask me, what do you do and how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you make consistently high returns? Totally illiquid, real assets only. We do something that all of you know is out there, but none of you do. We invest in a macro theme and a market trend and businesses. I don't invest in the latest stock report that says, here's the technical chart, buy this, sell that, move into the buy. It's irrelevant, right? Invest in economics, macroeconomics, first, second, third, and short term movements are irrelevant. All I do myself, it happens to be my thing, you pick your own theme and your own story, is our fundamental theme that the, the fundamental shift in global macroeconomics from the West to the East is permanent, irreversible, two billion people, a bit more, frankly, two and a half, and then another half a billion from ASEAN, three have permanently shifted into the world open, free trading, capitalist market economy. Okay? They're all becoming consumers. They're all, that way Friedman was right. They're all eating McDonald's. They all want to eat more meat. They all want to become middle class. They want their flat screen TVs. And the best expression, the purest expression of that is in Asia. I think they do better in Asia. I know there's interesting stuff going on in other BRICS in Latin America. I know there's some start of some stuff in Africa and East Europe. I'm not interested in that. Right? I'm interested in Asia. I live in Asia. Asia's a bit. So I, I picked a theme and a story. And I just invest in the, cons you know, I'm a consumption economist. I invest in what I talk about, the consumer. And the, for me, the ultimate expression is the cup. Right? Now, of course, they, it's actually the Tata the nano, <laughs> or, or the cherry, whatever it is, right? It's not that, right? But aspiration is what the middle classes are all about. So I thought I'd finish this session with an interesting, since I always love these interesting analytic questions, which, you know, egghead economists like, uh, we, uh, we love to sort of sit down and say, okay, what is the middle class? Okay, if we're going to invest in this. So I spend a lot of time thinking about what am I investing in and who are they and where are they? Right. And the, the metric I decided to use was car ownership. Now it turns out that that size is the middle class at 160 million in the G20 emerging countries. You all know what the G20 is, right? So it's that lot down there. It's all the exciting new development stuff.
stuff, which is uh, Indonesia. Hang on, that's not. You put in a lot of the EU countries. That's not. The so, so it's basically the emerging market. It's, it's the, the BRICS plus all the others. It's India, China, um, ASEAN, uh, the Latin American countries. Okay. I'm using that 160 million figure, but it turns out, and there's a World Bank standard which is too low for me, which is done by a couple of economists, uh, Mil Milonovic, uh, Yitzhak, which sizes it between 15 to $50 of disposable income per day, 370. But if you take household car ownership, okay, actually, it turns out the middle class, a lot of people are arguing, are a lot bigger than you think. It's great for me, because that's all I'm focusing on. Right? And all we do is pick a theme, and we pick a market, and we pick brands that they buy, spend a lot of time working out what do the middle class want, what do they buy, and what can we provide them. Okay. And that is all we're doing, so I think that's a team we need to think about. We are only still interested in the 160 million definition. If you don't own a car, you can't come to one of our stores in Sri Lanka. Right. Not because I won't allow you, but because you won't be able to spend anything. Of, of any reasonable sum, I would be interested in. Okay. So, across the chain, whether it's a consumer brand, whether it's a hotel or whatever, no car, you're not coming in. It's, by the way, a problem in, if you're going to play this theme because in building up investments and businesses, you've got to provide car parking because the trouble with the new emerging urban middle class Asian consumers, once they've got their car, they become such lazy bums. They won't move more than 10 yards from their car to whatever you're serving. Right? So you, you have to factor in the price of the car park. It's not a Singapore standard yet. Okay, the, the other, that's the old new thing. You all know about the rise of the Asian middle class consumer, but I wanted to hang, as I like to, let's hang some numbers on that for you guys to play. That's how you should be investing, actual thing. The new, new thing, right, which I thought cheekily I'd just stick up there for you, is, is this thing about Burma. Right? Look, I've been a fan of Burma for a long time. It's fantastic, the political changes. There is opportunity there. It's worth a look. Okay, but I think it's just too simple, right? Everyone's getting caught up by the excitement. Given other opportunities you can play for the emergence of an Asian middle class, right? You can do that better in a Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or a Cambodia or people that are a bit further up the curve than a place that's only just got up to $800 GDP per cap. $800, right? Not two and a half, three thousand 3000 like in Indonesia. 1,005 by Cambodia. The figure here is on a purchasing power parity basis. That's why it's a bit high. Okay? And it's still an agricultural country. If you take the equivalent figure for uh, in Indonesia or Sri Lanka or even in India, agriculture will only be top center of the okay? country. They're not all sitting out in the countryside planting rice. It's, it's got a long way to go. Okay? And compared to everybody else, you can see why I'd rather bet on a Cambodia, definitely bet on a Sri Lanka, right? A Malaysia, a Thailand. Thailand, by the way, has now got a lot of opportunity that they finally sorted out. Again, political, geopolitical noise, black swans are all gone. Now they can start to grow again. Vietnam, even the Philippines, which was always my favorite dog for a long time, is getting their act together and starting to get consumption and is a hell of a lot better bet than Myanmar at this stage. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Um, some of you always like some, uh, for, I, I do do sort of medium to long run growth bands for our own forecast, so I've decided to let, let you have those. Uh, by the way, this year we'll make this all available to you, so you'll actually get the presentations for those who want some of the data and the numbers, so you can take this away. But notice I have taken base level growth down, as most people. Don't think India, long run, can be China and do 8, 9%, okay? It's based long run, trend growth is 6%, and then you get structural deficits, and it comes back down. Right down. Yeah. Manwar Han Singh has finally woken up and started to do some reforms. You can argue better late than never, right? But it's very late in his second year term to do that. In the meantime, Indian growth rate is way off where it should be, and the guys have been asleep. Great shame. I love the Indian economy and subcontinental growth is all consumer driven. But they always, you know, they're their own worst enemy. Right? They, they just always 
can't get through all the political mud to actually do the reforms they need to be what should be a much better economy than the Chinese because it's consumption driven. So that's why that number looks a lot low, but I think that's a realistic one to use for forecasts. That's what we use. And look at China. You know, I think in the long run days of 9%, 10% are gone purely because of the demographic issue. And the EU, I'll be happy if they get 1%. Okay, they'll be in the dog cows for a long time. The US, to get long run trend growth, they're going back to 3%. That won't happen for at least another you know, three, four, five years. Okay, so this, this is my medium term. This takes you up to you know, two, 2014. However, when it comes in the US, it will go back to 3%, and it will be driven by the housing market, which is why if you want to invest early and bet on something, bet on US housing. Okay, that just leaves the US election. I'm not going to comment, <laughs> other than you know, pity the poor US investor. But either way, don't underestimate Republican venality and the potential to turn that fiscal cliff into a serious problem in January, if, particularly if Obama wins. Okay. And I thought I'd just bring that up because I just like it, right? I just like it. <laughs> I have to say, I, I, always, I, I, I always liked Strauss Kahn. He was, was a very bright guy. And when I was doing stuff in Indonesia, you know, I, at the pleasure of meeting, I had to work with him. You know, I didn't like their austerity. He was a very smart guy. And I, the other thing I have to say for him is if he was still head of the IMF, he was the only guy who could have pulled all those EU leaders together. We wouldn't have had this nonsense. Christine Lagarde doesn't have the same strength and presence to control them all. He did. He was the only guy who had, unfortunately, his taste for uh, you know any any woman he can get, black or white. And that, what I've heard is uh, so. I thought that was great. Um, so that's it. As I said, this is um, all available. We'll release it this time. Um, so you can, you can get the numbers. I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but you'll hear from the chamber. We'll most probably have a downloadable thing from the website, and uh, there'll be a few articles. On that as well. Okay. Um, we're, I need a drink. We're having drinks, aren't we? But yeah. any other questions before the alcohol? Right. Consumption.